Hello and welcome to Legally Speaking with me Tarun Nangia. Our topic of discussion today is the abuse of section 498A of the Indian Penal Code. Are men being victimized intentionally or unintentionally because of this draconian code? We will discuss all this in detail and to discuss this issue with me, I have with me Alkanshri Dahar, advocate, she is managing partner with Law Offices of India and Deepika Bharadwaj, she has made a documentary uh, on the subject of abuse of 498A and screened it all over the country and also many countries worldwide. She happens to work with a lot of, lot of lawyers in India and abroad on this topic. Uh, welcome Alkanshri, uh, welcome Deepika. Alkanshri, if I may ask you the first question. Uh, when you hear the section 498A and its implementations, and as a law you would have seen, what thought crosses your mind? The thought which crosses my mind is that 498A, the section 498 is just what we had required at the time and it was enacted. This is exactly what the women need. But what I also say in addition to that is implementation of any provision of law has to be dealt with with delicacy, with precision and focus. Any, any implementation of any provision of law which go beyond the section will take away from the force and the enforceability of that section. So we have to be very, very sure that any section which has been made for the welfare of a particular section of the society needs to be dealt with focus and should not be misused, which in the recent spate of judicial pronouncements, we can see that certain amount of thought needed to be given to it and which thankfully has happened in the past. Okay, Deepika, if I may ask you, what thought runs through your mind when you talk of Section 498A? Uh, Tarun, my experience comes a lot uh, from, uh, uh, from talking to people, uh, looking at these lives that have been destroyed because of the abuse of this law. So I think the first thing that comes to my mind when it comes to Section 498A, and it, this doesn't mean that I'm prejudiced against uh, anyone, is that this law has been used as a tool. Uh, in various and more circumstances where the marriage is breaking down because of any reason this law has been misused, this law has been abused uh, to settle scores, uh, to basically extort a lot of money which has been the case in a lot of cases. So I think this, this law has basically been used as a weapon of revenge. The law has been used as a weapon to settle scores. Absolutely. I take your point. Now I will read out a few statements from a judgment given by Justice UU Lalit and Justice Adarsh Kumar Goel on the issue of 498A uh, in which additional Solicitor General A.S. Natkarni submitted and I read there is a growing tendency to abuse section 498A by abusing the provision as a rope in all relatives of the husband including parents of advantage, minor children, brothers and sisters. So basically what the ASG said that there is a tendency to rope in the family members of the husband and get them arrested and this ends up breaking families. Alkanshri, would you agree that this provision ends up breaking families because you know the dispute may be between husband and wife but when even the brothers and sisters of the husband are arrested, the things may take an ugly turn. Absolutely, you are absolutely correct in that but in going further to what she was also saying is that it's just not section 498A of IPC that has been misused. If a person has to misuse a provision of section, it can be dealt with any provision of law. So, but right now, so, and the second step to that would be that it then would fall upon the judiciary to ensure that it is implemented in the right spirit and to put in safeguards through its judicial pronouncements to ensure that the intent and the spirit of that provision of law is, is adhered to the letter. Okay. Going further into that, yes, of course, because if you go in, in Rajesh Sharma and Arnish Kumar, the statistics which have been, uh, been uh, imposed. Yes. Upon, I mean, like, it's just that you have to see the figures to be able to understand what's going on. Now, the rate of filing of charge sheet was extraordinarily high. It's 93%. And the rate of conviction was something like 14 to 15%. You, you're absolutely true because I have few statistics here with me uh, to what Alkanshri was referring to. It states that in 2006, 58,000 cases were filed under Section 498A. 1.27 lakh people, 1 lakh 127,000 people were arrested, but 6,141 cases were declared false. But if you come to say about 2012, close to 2 lakh people across the country were arrested under Section 498A. But 
if you, if you see the statistics are very alarming. It says that out of this, first of all, 47,951 were women, perhaps the mothers and sisters of husband. But 2012 will also give you statistics like that out of all these cases, the conviction rate is as low as 14%. So Deepika, when conviction rate is as low as 14%, what does it indicate? A, that you know these cases are settled out of court or does it indicate that there has been some kind of abuse of the law? Uh, Tarun, I would want to uh, include both the things that you initially asked Zalka and, and this on, on statistics as well. Uh, the fact that all the there is a tendency to rope in all the family members has been commented upon by Justice Gyan Sudha Mishra also earlier in, in, in another judgment. And uh, it's, it's very, uh, I have often said this, I haven't seen any law in which, you know, you would have the brother, sister, uncles, aunts, uh, people sitting outside the country implicated in, in a matrimonial dispute. 498A is perhaps the only law in which you can name anyone and everyone. For example, in my documentary, there's an 89-year-old woman uh, who is now no more. She was named in the FIR and the case pertained to his grandson. So, you know, his you granddaughter... 89-year-old yeah. woman yes. was liable to be arrested. Yes, exactly. She was she was dragged from Delhi to Dehradun. And mean she, she was, was actually arrested in this case? She was not arrested. She was called for investigation from Delhi to Dehradun. And she was not able to walk. But the police called her and intimidated her, threatened her. The irony is there was no allegation against her. The, the FIR only mentioned her name that she was also cruel to her granddaughter-in-law. This, this so, th so, so this is, but we have to understand why this is done. This is done to put the pressure on husband's family, rope in as many family members as you want. When I was screening my documentary in Bangalore, there were neighbors who came to see the uh, film and shared with me that they got implicated in the case just because they were trying to help the couple and their name was dragged into it. And when we talk about statistics, the, uh, the statistics discuss National Crime Record Bureau. Now, what you have to see, uh, Tarun, and let me just quote this, uh, uh, and, and this particularly goes down to a lot of, there's now a lot of anger against the Supreme Court judgment and people are saying that, um, should we just consider National Crime Record Bureau data to basically uh, dilute a provision? Uh, in 2006, Section 498A's conviction rate was 22%. In 2015, it has come down to 14%. When we compare this to the average conviction rate under all other IPC crimes, it has gone up from 43% to 47%. So 498A for the last 10 or more years has had the lowest conviction rate among, amongst all IPC crimes. But when we look at the number of cases filed in 498A, there has been a rise of 100 to 150%. So there has been a huge rise in, in, in the number of cases filed, but obviously a drop down in the, in the conviction rates. And this definitely has to be seen more from the perspective that these cases, because of a lot of judgments and realizing that the law has been misused, uh, long time back, these cases started going to the women's cell. So we can say there is, there is a sort of analysis of the case in the women's cell as well before the FIR is registered and then the charge sheets are filed. So there's a lot of analysis, scrutiny, investigation of the case. Now after so much of uh, you know, understanding the, of the case, we would, I would likely believe that the cases only which are genuine or probably there is a lot of evidence in those, those cases they will end up into the I court, but point. that's not the that's, that's not, not what is happening. I bring furtherance to that. Yes. Perhaps it could also be that the expertise required to handle cases such as there is not there, and that is why I think the judgment which has been passed, this Rajesh Sharma, I think I think it's go will go a long way to ensure. Reading out right. from the same judgment, which is uh, uh, authored by Justice Uday Umesh Lalit, uh, he, it it states that no case under Section 498A of IPC should be registered without the prior approval of the Deputy Commissioner of Police or the additional DCP. It also states that the arrest of the main accused should be made only after a thorough investigation has been conducted with the prior approval of the Deputy Commissioner of Police. Now, the third point says the arrest of the collateral accused such as the father-in-law, mother-in-law, brother-in-law or sister-in-law should only be made with the prior approval of the Deputy Commissioner of Police. Uh, Alkanshi, if, if I may ask you. Uh, do you think that, you know, in practical speak, 
this would happen that you know permissions are taken or are, are these only on paper you of know of course they have to be taken and they are taken and it also says if you go further on the paragraphs after that also says that in case the police officers do not adhere to these then they can be departmental action against them or it can even amount to contempt of court so these are the guidelines that everybody the police officers have to go by and comply by that's law now uh, that's on. the law but I, deepika but I, I want to ask you, what's your practical experience? Yes, that's the law. That's exactly but what do I was... you see that happening on ground? Because when you see that even old people, like you said, an old woman of the age of 89 was dragged. Yep. Does that happen? Um, well, I would, um, uh, I would want to um, sort of try to, uh, uh, I would want to accept that these guidelines are followed, but practically these guidelines are actually not followed because these remain to be guidelines and not the statutes. I would not... Comp uh, paint it uh, with one brush that they are not absolutely followed. They, there has been a difference for sure. But just giving you a statistical perspective, uh, uh, before Arnesh Kumar judgment came in 2014, where it was said by the Supreme Court that there would be contempt of court initiated. And let me first bring a, uh, a perspective to that. CRPC 41A amendments came long time back. In 2010 itself, it was said that these guidelines need to be followed. These steps need to be followed before you implement an arrest. And that was not just for 498A, but for other IPC crimes as well. But what we saw that the number of arrests pertaining to 498 did not go down. They were huge. They were rising until 2013 as well. After 2014, Arnesh Kumar judgment as well. In 2015, the number of arrests under 498 are 187,000 uh, plus. Uh, there's a reduction of around 15 to 16 percent in number of arrests. Uh, so, so we have to see if statistically if these guidelines are followed or not. Um, but if these in, guidelines in, in, are not followed, then uh, the in, onus is what upon the thing to see. They might, they are provisions law, they are guidelines. If yeah. something doesn't happen, yeah. then we have the remedy. Then we can Absolutely. go to the court to go against it. Absolutely. But we cannot brush aside saying that but these things are not happening. The point being made was largely the what the people side of would, it. What is the practical, practical side? There's something laid down in the law that the prior permission of the deputy commissioner of police has to be taken before, you know, if, if, if the woman has actually not suffered any grievous injury, then do you arrest actually the relatives like the. If, even if you arrest the father-in-law and the mother-in-law, do you arrest the brothers, sisters and grandchildren? Do you do that? I mean, uh, but but so, so are these taken into account? Exactly. So I'll tell you what, Tarun, I think a lot of these things depend on the uh, amount of awareness that is there in the society. If we see in the cities, if we see in uh, tier one towns, then people, uh, I'm talking about the accused, uh, a lot of people now know of their rights and hence they are able to exercise those rights. But if we talk about uh, places where people just don't know anything, you know, they don't know about these judgments, they would just be dragged to the police station and beaten up and threatened and harassed and all that and they don't know anything. And even Could if somebody... Could they also become a victim to extortion by the police in that sense where you know... You know oh, yes, yes, there have been several reports in the newspapers where police... Uh, Constable, uh, police officers have been caught taking bribe from the accused in these cases, not just from the accused, but from the complainant side as well. There have been several more instances. I think what happens also is because of the emotions involved. It's a family law affair. So things tend to get a lot more sensitive and a lot more volatile. Yes. And that is why, that's why I think this uh, judgment, the Rajesh Sharma judgment, I think is on the dot. Yes. I think this is exactly what was required at this time to ensure that 498 goes a long way. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. So, so Speaking of the judgment where, you know, where we, we, we'll discuss the judgment in detail in our next episode, but if, if the law has been misused and we presume that this law has been misused, uh, do you think that the judgment is a remedy uh, or, or, you know, do you think there is something else that needs to be done or do you think the judgment is the final remedy for this? No, I don't think the judgment is the final uh, remedy to this in, in my own personal experience, Tarun, because uh, this whole tendency of, and I would not deny that other laws are not misused, other laws are also misused, uh, but the kind of uh, uh, evidence that has come come forward in terms of misuse of 498A, I haven't seen that kind of debate or discussion on any other misuse of any other law. Uh, so having said that, I think uh, this is not the ultimate remedy. This whole tendency of people to misuse laws and use laws as a tool to settle score, especially in a family setup, has to be discouraged. And I don't think that will happen until unless but people who misuse these laws are actually ha have a deterrent or, or, or that, that tendency is penalized, is punished and people are so told people that you... So people who misuse laws, in case a wife misuses a law against the husband to get his family members arrested, then there should be a deterrent. Well, Kalkanshri, let me go to a... See, law and society are subjects where, you know, laws need to be made 
opinion around you know what kind of societies that we Absolutely. live in so you know you can't maybe say have a law which is in the united states of america and just have no, it in india cannot. because societies are different Absolutely. Uh, now if i may ask you in that context do you see 498a playing some part in breaking up families because see once a woman in a traditional indian household or any indian household has managed to send the the relatives of the husband to jail in addition to the husband do you think the family can ever come back together let's speak practically rather than only from the point of law okay. from the practical point of view 498a ipc in india is required because okay. if we compare india to the rest of the countries we do need to realize and we do need to appreciate that the indian women uh, require the support of this section that is why the wording of the section is just 498a it doesn't say the husband but also says the relatives because the women they tend to stay in a setup yes. and yes. that is why by implication uh, the relatives of the husbands also get roped in now what you are asking me does it break the family up now you must also understand a woman will never go to the police and file a 498a until she is really pushed to the corner yes again the cultural setup comes so, into so play so you need to see the misuse needs to be stopped but there may be genuine cases also that we can't discuss most most definitely there's no denying on that but of course and that is That's why 498a on, on was that note enacted. Uh, on that note we'll take a short break and we'll be right back Welcome back. We've got Advocate Karuna Nandi joining us on the show. Yes. Deepika, you in your the process of making a documentary, you met hundreds of people who've suffered, uh, say, you know, sufferers of 490 as you call it. Uh, now I'm I'm reading a 2008 Madras High Court judgment. This states that it must be borne in mind that the object of enactment of Section 498A IPC and Dowry Prohibition Act is to check and curb the menace of dowry and at the same time to save matrimonial homes from destruction. our experience shows that apart from the husband all family members are implicated and dragged to police stations uh, and so on and so forth the arrest of the persons is not at all necessary in a number of cases such harassment is made simply to satisfy the anger and the ego of the complainant which in this case happens to be the wife what do you have to say of this i think i completely agree with it with my experience particularly tarun and and we have to keep in mind that most of these laws uh, value the verbal testimony of a complainant to a great extent so these are verbal allegations that have been put into the complaints and if if we look at the witnesses that have that come in 498a are usually of the woman and her family so if courts are making these statements it's not perception of false cases it's their experience of going through these cases for a long 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 period of time that they have come to a point where they are emphatically making a point that yes there are false cases yes there is abuse of process of law and if and this injustice or just unjust application of law has to be addressed and, the courts and that's are why this view. and that's why in rajesh sharma and others supreme court said that this is violation of human Deepika, rights i take your point i'm going across to alcantri alcantri i'll read you the rest of the comment which is made in the judgment by suitably dealing with such matters the injury to innocence could be avoided to a considerable extent by the magistrates but if the magistrates themselves accede to the bare requests of the police without examining the actual state of affairs it would create negative effects thereby the very purpose of the legislation would be defeated and the doors of conciliation would be closed forever across to karuna karuna reading the, the the rest portion of uh, the judgment of the court they said the husband and his family members may have difference of opinion in the dispute for which the arrest and judicial remand are not the answers the ultimate object of every legal system is to punish the guilty and project the innocents what would you say of this so i mean if we you you've heard me talking the whole judgment out reading it out what is your view on this judgment and the remarks of the court so a couple of thoughts when somebody goes to the criminal law um of course possibilities of reconciliation are you know practically closed right not always because i am a, a, a sort of appointed mediator in the supreme court 
And when we have issues before us um, and there is a settlement that is reached, then there is a possibility of actually settling, settling all the cases between the parties, whether it's a, a contract case on the Negotiable Instruments Act, uh, whether it's a dowry case, whether it's a, you know, whether it's anything. So one person can cooperate with the other in a quashing if the case is not compoundable, which means that if it can't be settled on agreement between both yes. parties. So of course that's true. Okay. However, so why is the court saying this here, the Madras High Court, right? What seems to underlie this presumption that a reconciliation is desirable is the fact that it is a family, you see. So now, um, uh, you know, as, uh, as you were mentioning earlier, I am, uh, so I am uh, leading the arguments on um, the constitutionality of the marital rape, rape exception. And a lot of the arguments in 498A are also brought in there, right? Basically, it's the default patriarchal power within the family being protected under the criminal law, right? So there's a presumption that even if a woman has been harassed, bullied, almost killed, right, that there would, want, there would be some necessity of some, um, uh, in the Madras High Court, we'll of course come to the Supreme Court judgment later, but there's, there's some desire, there's some necessity to reconcile. And so I guess the question I sometimes ask myself is that, I mean, if somebody is being that cruel to you, would you want to reconcile, right? You have a point. I think there. that's one question. And the second question I have is that, look, if you are killed or harassed or beaten or mentally harassed, you know, within the family, right? Isn't it worse, rather than being better, but here we, than uh, being, no, you know, no, harassed otherwise? take your otherwise? point, uh, Deepika, I would like to get you into the discussion. Uh, Karuna made a point that a woman actually would want to walk off the marriage because, you know, if she is being harassed or beaten, she would walk out. But here we are also speaking of the misuse of the law. Do you think that this is, this misuse is to an extent, because the courts have now stepped in, there would have been a certain extent of misuse, that's why the courts were forced to step in? I think there is no doubt that 498 has been grossly misused. It's not just uh, the courts, uh, but the uh, Law Commission report 243rd uh, discusses inputs so from discusses inputs so dis well discusses well. inputts from uh, various uh, people who are involved into these cases. Now, when it comes to uh, and and I I'm hearing this again and again, so I'm particularly answering to that. As far as reconciliation is concerned, Tarun, I have seen and known from, the, heard this from several people and this happens day in, day out in the courts, when there, it is often said after alleging this uh, uh, very strong allegations against the husband and his family, the woman would say, I want to go back. I want to go back. So th there is reconciliation now. Either you can look at this statement in terms of that she doesn't have anywhere to go or you can look at this in a statement that the allegations that were leveled were not exactly what happened. And now she is, after pressurizing the uh, husband and his family, she wants to reconcile. And the, in fact, Supreme Court has commented on this, I think in 2013, 2014, that uh, false cases under 498 and needs to be curbed now because husbands are getting adamant not to take back their wives. Okay, so now... So this, this, this we, points at this whole conciliation, reconciliation. And it's not just Family Welfare Committee has come in a part of as Rajesh Sharma. Uh, well, though this happens to be a non-bailable, non-compoundable section, there are counselings that, ha that, ha that have been happening in 498 in women cells, in mediation cells in the court. So there's nothing I new point, that Deepika, is but being we're commented upon. running now. out of time on this episode. So as Deepika said that there is uh, a tendency that there may be reconciliation even after the woman has filed a case under 498A. But now since we are totally running out of time, we'll take a round of closing comments. I'll country very quickly in about 20 seconds your closing comments on this issue. Section 498 IPC required, yes. Justice Lalit's judgment required, yes. I think what it does, it, it just stakes 498 a bit further in forcibility, the force, the intent, and the spirit of the section, I think, has been uh, dealt with in a most proper, and just, and a fair manner. So okay. I think we are just on the right track okay. on this. That's a good point. Uh, Deepika, your closing comments? I think uh, this judgment was needed uh, since a long time. Supreme Court has said, and all the other courts have said, uh, that 498A has been misused. So we really needed concrete measures to curb this misuse. I personally believe that this judgment addresses a lot of needs uh, uh, because of which, in a sense, were being harassed in 498A. Okay, I get your point. Karuna, your closing comments. Um, 
when we speak of misuse, the law of cheating is often allegedly misused. It is often misused because people go instead of under a, a suit, which takes a long time, they will sometimes bring a 20 case, as Alkam I, uh, will have seen a lot of as well. Um, a lot of laws are misused. There is the law of perjury. There is the law of malicious prosecution. What is happening here is that the focus is the um, man bites dog situation. Right? which is why the focus is on the false cases. And what is happening is inadvertently the large number of women who are victims of a violence in, within the home, in a patriarchal society, dowry violence, are slipping through the cracks now more and more. Okay, that's an that's a important point. Uh, in the next part of our discussion on 498A, we will discuss specifically the judgment of the court in this matter. Thank you so much for joining us in this episode.